Hello, this is Rebecca Fleetwood Hessian, host of the Badass Women's Council podcast. And back by popular demand, we have with us today Dr. Vicki Dalton. And the last episode that Vicki did with us just received so many comments. They're still coming in today. We had to do it again. So this time we're talking about, wait for it, relationships. Oh, yes, we are. And it is rich. So Vicki takes a stance that we're all, we need to take responsibility, ownership, accountability for our part in a relationship. So it's very practical, tactical. In fact, we cover things like how to fight. <laughs> There's some good information for you. The fact that we need to be comfortable being uncomfortable in order to have rich and rewarding relationships because we need to be able to be vulnerable. We talk about how as strong women, we really want to do things right and we want to just fix it and make things better and how that's not always working well in our relationships. And that this applies to relationships that are not just a, a spouse or a significant other, but close work relationships and work partnerships. We, we cross a lot of areas here. We also talk about how to coach those that we love and are in partnership with, how to coach them in what we need, how to ask for what we need. And we also cover how to give a good apology. Oh my gosh, so much in here today. So glad you're here. Enjoy. Hello, Vicki. Hi, how are you? I'm great, thanks. Good. I'm glad you were willing to podcast with me again. Sure, this is fun. So if you want to go back in the history, uh, I have Vicki Dalton with me today, who was my therapist. <laughs> and I love the joke that I even said on the last podcast that it was the first time I pulled in the parking lot and knew I didn't have to pay to be here. So <laughs> that's that's really good. That's so the last time you were on, we talked about strong women and the stuff that gets stuck in our head and just really rich rich discussion. So if you haven't listened to that yet, I highly recommend that you do. But today we're going to talk more about relationships and specifically relationships where strong women seem to have everything else in their life kind of together, but the dating or the marriage or the relationship or something else just isn't going well. And and I've found as I've been interviewing with people with this whole badass women's council idea of strong women, that it's kind of a theme. It's, you know, it, it happens way more than I thought it would, where I see people that have it totally together. And then when you talk to them about the relationship, it's not so together. How, how can we keep so much of our lives going well and that part doesn't? What well, I happens? feel like it's some of it's a bit of a kind of a self-fulfilling prophecy, right? I mean, if we're talking earlier, we were talking about the need to sort of be in that headspace and be self-aware. Um, but at the same time, um, when that uh, introspection piece leads you back to thinking about, like, say, your mate, your partner, um, your spouse, um, it involves some pretty difficult discussions. Um, mm -hmm. And a lot of times uh, it can require two people, first of all, to have some of those discussions. Mm -hmm. When I think about, I think sort of the phenomenon that you're referring to is that a lot of really strong women um, who are doing really well behind the scenes um, play a very different role in the marriage than what they mm -hmm. play in a lot of the rest of their world. Um, and uh, they oftentimes don't know how to get out of that role or perhaps their mate doesn't want them to. Um, and there's some real resistance to that. Talk and, about that. So what would that look like? Give me an example. Well, it's not uncommon, I feel like, for someone to, uh, for me to be in, work with an executive or work with a somebody who's at really at a pinnacle part of their career, um, but at home, they almost have like a second class status. Mm. Um, and so they don't feel empowered to make the decisions um, or they are sort of treated um, as less than even an equal authority mm. on the household management or whatever. Um, and so it's sort of fascinating, but it happens pretty frequently. Interesting. And sometimes I, I have the women explain it to me that they're okay with it or they thought they were okay with it for a long time because quite frankly, they have so much stress 
in the rest of their life. So they don't they want to like, have to take care yeah. of everything. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And so, but when they start to notice that it shifts from, I appreciate and value that you're managing a lot of things to recognizing I'm, I can't manage things. Mm -hmm. I'm not allowed, you know, to the, at what point in time did it turn to where I was in a one down position? Mm -hmm. um, and when you go to challenge sort of that status quo, um, it becomes an issue. Frequently, I mean, there's different circumstances that can build for any number of reasons, but some really common themes are this relationship started pretty early in life for them, you know, in their early 20s, maybe before, even before they had that executive before, job. Yeah. And before they were really coming into their own, especially if we go back to that, you know, what I referred to before is that 1640 60 rule. Oh, don't um, say that again, because um, some people may not have heard that first podcast and it was really good. Yeah. So, so there's this concept of at 16, you feel like you're on stage, everything matters, you feel really insecure, everybody's watching you and judging you. And that's like high school and they kind of feel like they are. Mm -hmm. um, and it just feels really vulnerable. At 40, you reach sort of a point of not caring about what the rest of the world is thinking about you and judging you. And you live your life more the way you want to live. You raise your children. You manage your household. Um, you do things more with your own set of confidence. And people can just sort of kiss your ass. Mm -hmm. Pardon for the nope. language. We're, we're allowed to um, do that here. But at the, you know, and then by the time you reach into your 60s, you have this like little light bulb moment that nobody was ever paying attention to you anyway. Even <laughs> back in high school. part of you's like, damn it, I kind of want people and to pay attention yeah, to me now. <laughs> there's, but mostly it's freeing though. But yeah, mostly right. it's freeing. Um, and so part of our job in counseling is like, why do we have to wait until we're 60 mm -hmm. to have that realization and some of that freedom. So, so some of this, so when you're 16, 18, then your twenties, you still are feeling that, you know, more insecure and smaller. Mm -hmm. Um, and then you sort of come into your own and you sort of grow if, and, and, um, and especially if, you know, you're introspective and you do work on things and you grow, but that doesn't always mean that your spouse is going to grow with you. Mm -hmm. And for a lot of spouses, it becomes pretty intimidating. Um, for them oh, to have yeah. a successful spouse, even if they too are successful. So much of their identity is sort of brought up in their role in the household as well. And mm -hmm. as as their wife grows and changes, it, some men find it emasculating. Mm -hmm. um, some men uh, feel the need to maintain a certain degree of control to make them feel different. And, and quite frankly, sometimes that dynamic works for people. Mm -hmm. But as a lot of women continue to grow and sort of in their maturity and, and grow in their success and their confidence and their abilities, um, they almost like kind of intentionally encapsulate that part of their personal life because it requires some change within the dynamic and that requires two people. And, um, sometimes they don't have the confidence in that world. Sometimes the spouse unintentionally or intentionally inspires that lack of confidence. Mm -hmm. I've heard um, that and we've seen that. Um, and then there's a little bit of light bulb moments that sort of start to, to show, um, and then they're left with a pretty difficult crossroads, mm -hmm. you know, to deal with. And it's not uncommon for me to get couples coming in at that point um, in their lives. And they have a good shot. They have hope if both because parties are coming, coming in. And let's saying, let's discuss it. Yeah. So sometimes um, these women are drawn to really strong characters, too. Yeah, right? right. I mean, we have it in us. So you wouldn't want somebody weak as a partner necessarily. Mm -hmm. So by definition, they probably chose a pretty strong personality to kind of have to go toe to toe with. Um, and if those conversations don't sort of unfold the way that they do when you're raising your children and the way that they do when you're, you're building your, your practice, your career, um, you know, it requires communication in order to on grow, both parts, on both parts. Um, and the ability to pay attention to what role do you play in this? What is your mm -hmm. accountability? What is your ownership of it? Because that's only the part you can change. Because those are the two things that you you help you with ownership and accountability versus fault and blame, fault and blame, or the shame and judgment mm -hmm. type of piece. So, so that's pretty much my whole therapeutic approach. You know, comes back to accountability and ownership. What role do you play? Because that's all we have the ability to truly right. manage. Right. Um, we can't change other people, but we can change how we treat them, and oftentimes it forces them to treat us differently in return. And that doesn't always work as well within a relationship dynamic um, if the other party isn't willing to work with you on it. And, and I think it's really important to highlight what you said about if you've met your significant other early in life and you've not had maturation at the same rate right. mm -hmm. and you've not been respectful of each other's journey and kind of where, where you end up, that can create conflict and challenge. Mm -hmm. And the kind of conflict and challenge that grows over years without the communication. Mm -hmm. So what could have just been, you know, a smaller crack can become a chasm. Mm -hmm. um, and then that feels insurmountable to overcome. And 
Um, and, and you can see the difference in the growth in, in women in particular, when they have a spouse who is their greatest supporter, mm-hmm. um, oh, who is, so true. and, and you see the, how much easier it is for them to manage happiness, how much, how, how and it's not that they don't go through the challenges, correct. It's how they manage the challenges that helps them grow together. Doesn't correct. create a greater divide. Correct. And so the idea of being able to have some of those conversations early on in life, right? So as the growth starts to happen for that woman, we'll say in this case, and she's doing, you know, really well, and she's kind of getting this little bit of passive aggressive, cold shoulder. Why aren't you excited for me mm-hmm. more? Or can't you take care of that? So I can, I, I got this meeting I really need to get right. to, and this is right. super important. And, and instead they get the pushback of, so you're choosing your career over us. Um, those kind of little comments. And so going back to some of our earlier topics of these belief systems that we start to develop, Mm -hmm. these comments that get made to us, whether they're intentional or not, that makes us start to question or absorb or believe things. Um, And so it, it builds. Mm -hmm. So this concept of, of not having a partner, a spouse to support you along the way can undermine. And then you feel like you have to do it all. Either do it all or pull back on one direction or another. Right. Mm -hmm. Right. Correct. I can think of examples of this right now. Good examples. Let me give you one is uh, my good friends and, and she's actually a member of the Badass Women's Council as well, Scott and Emily Sutherland. And they have a podcast called Love Better. And the reason they have a podcast called Love Better is they intentionally made the choice to have those tough conversations early on and weather those storms because they had storms. Like when you get to know them, if you don't know them well, you think, oh, they're that super cute, airy, fairy couple, the dream state that nothing bad ever happens to these people. Look how happy they are. And then you peel one layer back and you get to know them and you realize they're that couple because they have worked damn hard to be that couple. And through all of the challenges of their you know, 20s and raising kids, all this stuff that happened, they locked arms and said, okay, we're in this together and forced themselves to have those conversations. That's why we look at them today and think, oh, they're, they're, they're great. Yeah, they worked hard at being great. It didn't just happen. And I think that's incredibly important for people to understand too. In today's culture where um, we are, you know, we struggle with the idea of conflict um, and, and how do you reach resolution? How do you agree just to disagree? Mm-hmm. Um, and learning, you know, that, we need to teach that in yeah. society yes, real quick. We, if we could do that. a whole nother podcast yeah. that I could totally yeah. go off on. But, but in the big scheme of things, you know, it, it's not that you and your partner have to be identical and lockstep about belief systems and about um, where the relationship's going or heading, but you have to have the conversations. Mm-hmm. And my experience has been, um, when I talk to couples, um, and couples are fun. If they're coming here, <laughs> you know, watching them work through a good fight and come to the other side of it. I gotta think some of my sessions with you and couples <laughs> weren't fun, but okay, keep going. <laughs> they can be fun. Let's put it that way. Um, but if they want to get to the other side, if they're coming in and they're listening and they, they take the feedback and they let me redirect them and point out the accountability part. Okay, when you said it this way, this is how it gets heard. Um, and it's not their spouse telling them that. That's sort of the benefit of the third party. But but ultimately, having those difficult conversations. And and when I talk to couples about, okay, after you've had like the fight and it didn't go well um, and things kind of start to cool down, you got to go back and visit. And I tell you, they look at me like I... <laughs> I grew a second head and he, like, the men were like, she just started talking to me again. I am not bringing this yeah, back up. I don't want to bring it back um, up. And so, so they, those don't get resolution and they get attached to the next thing ah, that you argue about. So you drag it into the next fight unintentionally. Correct. And it builds. And, and the builds. emotions. And, and a lot of times I'll have folks with insight, you know, they're, they're paying attention to their accountability and ownership and they'll hear like, I am irrationally angry about this mistake that they made. It is not worth this level, you know, that's of emotion. That's the good self-awareness That's the good self-awareness. They there. may not be able to stop the crazy train from pulling mm-hmm. out of the station, but they have that awareness and then we can work backwards. Where did that come from? You didn't get resolution on this issue. You've got some longstanding, you know, frustration. And that's what happens for a lot of, of strong women mm-hmm. getting to a certain stage in their life and sort of recognizing where is my tribe. I take care of so many people. Who's in my Who's corner? taking care of me? Yeah. And, and who can I lean on? And, you know, who's my soft place to fall or my hard rock to lean mm-hmm. on? Um, and, and certainly that has impacted a lot of relationships. Because I think about the ones that are really struggling. I've already pinpointed a couple of things that you said. In, in one situation, I can, I can think of, you know, the, the maturation thing was part of it where she just had grown exponentially and he just was intimidated by it and didn't, didn't want to 
didn't want to even have the conversation. And, in, and instead of being able to work through it together, what they end up doing is she takes care of everything for everybody all the time. And she's exhausted and a little resentful. And ultimately, it'll come out. Mm-hmm. That's sort of the, the, the piece. That's what's that, kind of starting you know, to if you I gave her your name, by the way. <laughs> I think we'll see. Yeah. We'll see. Um, but I think, you know, ultimately, I mean, it will leak out. I mean, I don't really, I'm not a Freudian based therapist um, in any way, shape or form. And I probably don't give him enough credit. Maybe I mean, it was a pretty long time ago and he figured out a few important things. And, yeah. and this is one of them. But if you have some, something big happening in your life, an emotion, a situation, and you don't have a healthy way to express it, to manage it, to deal with it, it will come out. And it will come out wherever your natural crack in the dam is. Mm. And we all have it. Mm -hmm. So it's that pressure build. So maybe it's a risk for depression or anxiety um, or sleep difficulties or an unhealthy relationship with food or um, any number of risk factors. That's where it's going to come. And so the same thing is true within a relationship. You know, I had my favorite story to tell about couples, and I hope they... I'm not identifying them, but (laughs) I loved it. I oftentimes ask a couple to give me a conversation, to have a little bit of an argument in front of me. Let me see how you fight. Um, Nothing too big. Give me something really (laughs) minor. And let me see how you communicate, how you fight through it. Um, And they looked at each other, this couple, and they looked at each other and they're like, I know what it is. I knew exactly what it was going to be. Immediately. Immediately. And they both said toilet paper. And I thought, oh, are we going to have like the over or under? Yeah. Like like, that's what I was thinking. That's it? No. No. And it got heated fast. Like I'm thinking... Am I going to call 911? <gasps> kind of heated fast. And they never changed their words. Their language was all still about the toilet paper. But um, it wasn't but it was about, so the toilet. Not about the toilet paper. <laughs> um, and it was sort of like train wreck watching. Like I couldn't, I knew I needed to intervene oh gosh, at some point. But it was sort of because there was so much built up. And in this particular couple situation um, was, you know, she had essentially looking at it from very different conversations, different perspectives, and they weren't sharing what was happening for them. Mm. So ultimately, he had um, agreed and she'd agreed when they had kids, she was going to stay home, be the mom with mm-hmm. the kids and give up her career. And that meant he was going to have to take on a more challenging job or work more hours to right. kind of manage that. Um, and I think they ended up having three kids. And at this point, by the time I was meeting with them, the youngest was now in kindergarten. It was in, um, or maybe it was first grade because this was several years ago. Um, and so full time was back in school. And the conversation that wasn't taking place between the two of them you know, was he was resentful of his, how much he was working, how hard he was working. Yeah. Um, he was tired and she's sitting at home eating bonbons now. Oh, yes. And, we all know that's what yeah, parenting that's what children it is. is. <laughs> right. And if your kids are in school, what are you doing all day? Oh, kind of a thing. And yeah. she's sitting at home. Yes. Managing life and taking care of things. And I think really managing it really well by his own admission. No, she's done a great job and that, you know, all that. Um, but um, I gave up my career mm-hmm. and now my children are launching a little bit further. I am like 12, 15 years out of my career. If she had the type of career, you couldn't just step right back into. So now she's afraid um, even about going back. Probably. And she was resentful mm-hmm. and she was resentful. So where the toilet paper came in <laughs> because I was, at, and I found all this out later, but where the toilet paper came in, it wasn't the, you know, do you put, put the over the over roll or under. under roll? It was. He over might, is right, by the way. Keep going. I would actually happen to agree. <laughs> and I'm sure there's a personality <laughs> test out there about it somewhere. Someone tell us. Um, but ultimately, the, his, what he would do, like, you know, he may use up the last of the toilet paper, get down a new roll, but not put it on the container, not put it on the, the hanger. He would put it on the back of the toilet Crime. every time. Um, and she would be like, really? You do nothing. You can't even do that kind of a thing. Like mm-hmm. you won't even do it. And his point was, what do you have to do? I won't take care of anything. Oh, it is about the toilet paper. About the toilet, it, it manifested it, all, all into the these toilet other paper pieces. Roll. So they were, I mean, in each other's face, finger pointing, shouting, F bomb dropping. I'm afraid a punch was going to be thrown. And they never stopped talking about the toilet paper. Oh you could gosh, put it on. Fascinating. And so pretty quickly. And so part of what we talk about is respectful communication. If you can't communicate respectfully, you're in trouble. Mm-hmm. Um, and so when these couples that I work with or with women that I work with kind of early on and they're tired and they are exhausted mm-hmm. or they should be by their days as we've had discussions. Right. Um, what, you know, how do you have that conversation with your spouse? How do you respectfully ask for help? How do you, you know, point out what role you feel like they could contribute to? Mm-hmm. Um, how do you have those discussions? Because if you can't have a true partnership, you know, in it, and if there's an aspect of say perhaps resentment or insecurities um, that are building in, in the partnership, it will leak out and it'll leak out in these passive, sometimes not so passive mm-hmm. aggressive right. type of ways. And it gets attached to other things. And then you have conversations about things that really aren't relevant and meaningful. Um, God, I, everybody I know is either on the treadmill or in their car, shaking their head, either 
having been through something like this or knowing somebody that's having these kinds of fights. Yeah. And and it's not so much that people can't get through. Sometimes, like I said, I enjoy a good, healthy fight if you can fight fair. Right. Um, But ultimately, because feelings need to be shared and feelings need to be valid doesn't necessarily mean that that their perception of what is happening or what's going on inside that person's head is accurate. Mm -hmm. I mean, we have research that shows that after a couple has been together like six months or more, they kind of have their own language. Yeah, like they yeah. can kind of talk to it like, hey, get that thing over there from, you know, where we got that once. Mm-hmm. And, and they know what you're talking <laughs> and about. They, yeah. And everybody else has no clue. So you do that. But probably by the time you've been in, in a marriage much length of time, a year or two, we have research that shows you are probably 90 to 95 percent right, accurate in interpreting the emotion that you're picking up on from your spouse. OK, really accurate a lot of the time. Um, but it's estimated about 50 percent of the time you are wrong about the thought process that's going mm. on in that person's head about that emotion. But because you feel like you know them so well, even if we can get to the point of good conversation, yeah. your own kind of arrogance won't let it be what it is. So that person will shame it, but that's not what I was thinking. Here's what I was thinking. And, she, and they share it. And in your own head, you're thinking, uh-uh, you just don't want to tell me. Oh. So you even dismiss it when you get the good communication. When you get the communication. So, so you know each other really well. You pick up on body language. You pick up on subtleties or the lack of language. Mm-hmm. You know that. And if you don't want to have the tough discussions um, and you avoid it, um, then it goes to the next step and that chasm Another, grows. Yeah. And you believe whatever was going on inside your head was the case, was accurate, and there's no challenging of it. So and those no beliefs growth. become truths Truth. and you build on them and they're and inaccurate. You li- and you live your life by them. Oh. Um, and so, and and again, you know, I, I do feel like there's sort of this shift of, of women, you know, really becoming empowered. Um, and recognizing their own strength. Mm-hmm. And I think we're starting to get a little bit better as other women supporting each other. It's it's a growing I'm process. trying to help with the movement. I appreciate it. Yes. And, and I, I think there needs to be more warriors like you out there with Thank it. Um, but at the end of the day, we're still looking to our partners too mm-hmm. for those pieces. Because this whole, you know, we, I talk about reflection and connection. Connection isn't just with other women. It's also connecting at home with your spouse, right? Correct. And, and the ways that we do that can have the same kind of practices, right? So it's not assuming that you know, because we talked about in the other podcast, we, we make a lot of assumptions about mm-hmm. other strong women when we see them or other women in general. And, we, and so it sounds like we're doing the same thing at home. We make assumptions based on our experience instead of letting the conversation play out and really hearing the other person and opening and open, allowing ourselves to open up and be vulnerable and have the conversation. Correct. And being able to share those vulnerable pieces with a partner when you're not necessarily feeling like it's completely safe to do so. It's mm-hmm. a very hard thing to do. And the safety is not is not often, I hope, about a physical safety. It's the emotional safety mm-hmm. um, that maybe we present as that confident person and maybe we really do feel very confident in our abilities in our workplace or in, right. in some of those environments. But in our home, you know, that impersonator, that fraud, this person knows me better than anybody else. Mm-hmm. Do they think that about me? Um, do yeah. they perceive me as, as incapable um, and incompetent. And if they make any statements that are negative, are we at risk for absorbing them deeper? We take them even more personal than the stuff we get at work, right? right. That's a general, a yeah. Yeah, as a general rule. Weighty place in our hearts and minds. And a lot of times our spouse doesn't know that. Not a lot of times they don't. Sometimes they certainly do, and it could be power that they wield in a healthy or unhealthy way. Mm-hmm. Well, there's that. Um, but a lot of times they don't. If we don't communicate, you know, with them, the impact of those words mm-hmm. or how, you know, we interpret them, um, then that's the accountability ownership part. Right. That I kind of come back to if you don't share it and take it to that next step. I mean, my, my couples, I am like, I'm like a broken record. I will say things when we're in, in counseling, like, okay, take it to the next step, take it one step further in that communication, share what that meant to you, what that felt, how that impacted you. One step out of the comfort zone. Right. Right. That's a great way of wording it. Right. Because when we talk a lot about learning in the learning space that the best learning happens just one step in discomfort. Like if you're a little uncomfortable, your learning goes up. So right. you're just pushing people in past that comfort zone a little bit. And it's how we grow and it's how we change. Mm-hmm. And a lot of times, you know, I, I kind of give people the gift of this doesn't have to be right the first time around. Just I say anything worth it. doing is worth starting poorly. Okay. I'll, right? take, I'll take that. Right. It's worth starting. And if it happens to go poorly, it's still learning. Yeah, it's okay. It's still learning. It's still learning. And so, and the goal is not about shaming and blaming, getting in that head trash space about it when it didn't go well. And when you can be mindful without the judgment, you can now start exploring why did that happen? Mm-hmm. Why did that outcome? 
present as that. Yes, what role did I play in it? Therefore, what role can I do different? Mm -hmm. And so when we talk about implementing that within our relationships, implementing it, we talk about getting together with a group of women and, and being vulnerable and sharing and learning and laughing and growing. The same thing really applies within our relationships, you know, at home and even to a certain extent with our children. Well, and I'm thinking about the impact when you don't allow yourself to have those kinds of communication at home. So you're not modeling it for your kids. So generationally, we start to break down, which is, I think, kind of where we are. And how many of us, I mean, know that, you know, you can recognize I'm behaving like this parent. Mm -hmm. Um, I never thought that I would do this and now I'm doing it. Sometimes it's a joke. Like, I can't believe I just said there are children in Africa that would love to have this food. You know, (laughs) I said I would never say that, like that kind of a thing. So, um, and that's sort of humorous, whatever. But the truth is we, how we first learn to think, feel, interact, understand, interpret this world, we learn in our families of origin. Um, And so that applies to our children, that applies to us. And even if you knew that what you grew up in was unhealthy, Mm -hmm. um, if you don't have another behavior to model, um, you're at risk for maybe the pendulum swinging too far the other way or having to kind of figure it out as you go. And if you're not willing to be introspective and grow and change. Which is where you, if you are, if you haven't had it modeled for you, you do have to be introspective enough to say, okay, I know that's not what I want. So how am I going to go learn better behaviors for myself? Right. And if you've been into a certain pattern and I'm asking you to change and to do something different Mm -hmm. that is out of that comfort zone and trying to do things. And there's pressure on um, us to feel like we have to do it right um, the first time. And I think that's where our our strong women audience gets caught up. One, one, they, we we think we need to do it right. And we think we're more in control of like, we think we got to fix it. Like I can fix this. I'm, I, I, I got this. I it's got fine. This. And if it doesn't go well, I'm not going to tell anybody it didn't go well. Mm. I don't want anybody to know like this piece of it. Or yeah. if I tried to have this conversation with my spouse and it was sort of disastrous, you know, you're less likely to share that um, with your girlfriends if you're afraid and concerned about what they're going to think and feel about you. Because we've talked about that in my situation. You know, I was married for 18 years and much of it was not so hot. And I didn't share that with anybody. And the only people who knew that are people that were super close to us. And the reason I didn't share it is I was protecting, I thought I was protecting him and our relationship because I always was hopeful that it was going to get better. Every year it was like, oh, well, next year will be better. And you thought you could fix it. Yeah, I did think I could fix it. (laughs) And we're working really hard on it, which meant I was reading all the books and working really hard on it. But I I just thought, well, when it gets better, I, I don't want people to think ill of him or us. I just, I, I just thought, why bother sharing that? I, you know, I got this. It's fine, and that was not good. No, and and it kept things from being more honest and genuine. Mm-hmm. Um, and there had to be some aspects of you worrying about people perceiving. Yeah, something negative we talked about, about that this morning. Even I was like, mm-hmm. I think probably buried in there was a healthy shot of ego that just said, you know what, everything else in my life is good. I don't, I don't need to share that. Right. And, and I'm not a complainer. It's just as a general right, rule, I don't, nature. I don't like to complain. So anything that would have been talking about um, that my marriage wasn't good would feel like a complaint to me, which is icky in my world. And so, and since you were so focused on growth and improvement, you know, the idea of you not being able to do that in your own marriage yeah. um, is pretty devastating to a person, to a which soul. Which is why I spent a lot of time here on this couch <laughs> paying you. <laughs> <laughs> Happily, by the way, I said this in the other podcast, I'm going to say it loud and proud. I love therapy. I think everybody should experience some therapy. Healthy, great, wonderful people could grow and learn from therapy. And this is the same concept, like I said then, I'll say now, is, you know, you have a good group of people that you share open and honestly with. You grow from that experience. You evaluate. Um, You know, your girlfriends may not may not tell you if they hear something particularly unhealthy about what you're saying. Um, A lot of other strong women might, but not necessarily all of them. A therapist, by definition, is supposed to tell you. Exactly. And, you know, that's what I love about the Badass Women's Council that that we put together with these seven strong women that we get together regularly is we are, we love each other enough to be honest with each other about our businesses and about, you know, even if somebody just walks in and they've just got that look, somebody will pull them aside and say, yeah, okay. And it doesn't have to be public because we're not asking you to come to true confessions, but somebody inevitably will, will, will come up to, to me or I'll go to them and just say, I just want to make sure you're okay today. And it's knowing that you've got people that care about you in that way is a game changer. I mean, I can't even tell you the courage that gives me to know that I can completely be all of myself with those those women. Was it scary in the beginning? 
I think all of us would say it was a little bit scary, but we came into it with that intention. It didn't happen by accident. We said to each other, we are all entrepreneurs, which is a pretty lonely profession. Mm -hmm. And so if we're going to not be lonely and and go through this, how, how can we just do life together? So that was really the common bond that we all shared is we all wanted that. But it did take a while to get to know each other. And, and we st- now we're just, a, we've been together a year. Um, somebody said the other day, we've kind of reached that storming part. So now we're starting to look at each other's personality differences and really dig into um, how different we really are. And, and, and we're staying involved in, in that relationship, even though sometimes it's like, it's not easy like it was in the beginning because, you know, the honeymoon stage is over. It's been a year. Right. It's getting real. It's getting real. Mm -hmm. And so now we're really digging in and starting to understand each other's personality profiles and being intentional about it. So I think that's the the difference is we were intentional about, we were coming to this group to be vulnerable. And you were coming in with the understanding is a safe place to share. Yeah. And that is to be, and Mm -hmm. that is freeing. It's not uncommon at all for me to to have these conversations. I know we're we're talking a lot of times about spouses Mm -hmm. um, and about maybe women supporting women, you know, with this concept. But I will talk with so many adolescents, particularly adolescent females more. And a lot of times I have very strong growing women as part of my practice. Mm -hmm. I, I think it's an interesting there's probably something to that dynamic that gets them to me or their families to me. Mm-hmm. I'm um, glad they are. But I will you. frequently talk with girls about like, who do you have to share to? I'm hearing you tell me these stories and you're, and you're wanting some advice about how to help your, one of your friends. And that's great. And you're talking about the stress that that puts on you or whatever, but, and that's great. But who do you go to? Mm-hmm. Who, and, you know, and, we, and of course we talk with parents cause we're talking about adolescents well, or whatever. Right. Everybody but does. Because they need to know their parents are there, yeah. but they're most likely to be sharing day to day, you know, with their peers. And more often than not, I'll see these growing strong women. Well, not really anybody. And oh. then we'll kind of talk about you sort of backing yourself into a corner and I'll even sort of prepare them. We want to try and do this different. And this is a safe time in your life to do it. But you may have to provide some of your friends with a little bit of a roadmap of what you need when you do share, because they may genuinely not know to do what to do with you when you share you're having a bad day. They are in such a role of, of leadership or strength that they don't know how to respond to you. You may have to follow it up with, and I really feel like I could use a hug. And they'll give you that hug. Oh they'll my know gosh, what to but do. asking for but what asking you need and setting need. expectations. And even just describing that you might need something. And it's and the the look on these you know young women's faces of, are you sure this is a good idea? What if, oh, what if so they important. don't do anything with it? And I'm like, well, they may not. And we'll, we'll deal with that. But you're responsible and accountable for asking, for asking and letting them know and kind of coaching them into the idea of seeing you as not just sort of an emotional leader, the mini pseudo therapist in the group here, yes. but instead a person with needs and balancing that and getting comfortable with that. Can you imagine how different we could be as strong women if we were comfortable with that and asking for support and help at 17, at 15 oh among gosh. our peers? You know, it's just, there are so many strong women who have always been the strong woman. Well, and it's why I started this thing. I mean, I I, I wanted to be more of, I didn't, I needed more of that. I needed to, a space to be more vulnerable. And I, now that I'm opening up this conversation with other people about it, it's far more prevalent than I even thought, which is why I started this podcast. And one of my friends who is the epitome of, of strength and smart and just classy. Like everybody loves her and she is the person that everybody goes to. And she's a, you know, a coach and a consultant. I mean, she's made a career out of everybody right. coming to her and she went through a devastating breakup, like TV movie, devastating, mm. bad, bad things happened. And immediately after, and she handled it like you would have expected her. She, you know, went in, just handled it. But she will say to you, I never got the breakdown that I deserved after that is her quote, which I love because what happened was immediately people just stepped back in like, oh, now that, now you that you're together. divorced and you got it together, like I, I need you again. Like family, like her mom was like, okay, so now, and just like moved on like life is normal. And she was like, could I just have like a little breakdown time, people? Could you just back off for a minute? I'm allowed so I, to be a hot mess for a little bit. Could I just be a, a hot mess? Give me a minute. And it's fascinating to me how often that happens. We've played the role for so long without setting expectations that we might need you. And, and when I do, here's what I, I'm, I'm going to. And now she's starting to set better boundaries because she's recognizing nobody's just going to 
give it to her without her asking for it. And it doesn't mean that they don't care about her. That's the other piece that I but think it feels have, that way that they have to yeah. sort through the head trash the head kind dress, of stuff yep. that you're talking about. Doesn't mean they don't care. They just haven't put her in that context. Mm-hmm. And you know, and I can kind of remember some of those conversations with my kids, sort of recognizing me as a person. Mm-hmm. Like that little light bulb moment, like, oh. It's like the first time you see your teacher in the grocery store and you realize yes. that they, they are real, yes. they're a person too. It's like, yes. wow, that's weird. And so that's, and it's a healthy concept. But, you know, when you, when, and, and I think we're more at risk when we are that strong person that people don't think about us having needs. And then we feel guilty if we have a need, if we don't work through some of those insecurities or some understandings. And if we're in a relationship that creates a sense that you are being selfish Mm -hmm. if you have a need, then it can further support that dynamic. And it's just bringing up, I I had a screaming match with my mother after I went through my divorce because I just needed space not to have to worry about anybody's stuff. And I was typically the person that hosted all the stuff and made sure everybody got together and did this and that. And I hadn't been doing that, which was a disappointment to those people. And in my mind, I was thinking, surely you don't expect that of me. But I hadn't said that. And I think they thought that I enjoyed it so much that that would be the thing I went to as part of my healing process. I didn't want any part of it, but I didn't say that to anybody. Right. And so the one time, you know, my mom called and said, you know, I, she was disappointed. I hadn't done something of getting people together or some celebrating something like I hadn't done in the past. I just lost my shit screaming (laughs) and yelling and 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 now recognizing I had never communicated what I needed. What you needed. Well, mm-hmm. I did in that moment, but not in a really good way. But but we did get to a good place after that conversation. My mom handled it like a champ. She was like, <laughs> she was yeah, like, absolutely. okay, I, I hear you. And I didn't know. And I think, and I do think it's sort of part of the the, the need for that growth piece of understanding it's okay to ask for help, but recognizing especially in those early stages of making this transition, you may have to coach people on what you need, mm-hmm. including I, when I talk with a lot of my women, I talk to them about, I'm giving you permission to reserve the right to change your mind about what you thought you needed. Because oh, you yay. may not know what you actually need. You may think you want that hug and it may not go well. It may be that you need a laugh or it may mean that you need an escape. Or but that you, you have to be intentional about telling somebody that you've changed. Yes. You can't yes. just change and not say, oh, by the way, I changed my mind on what I needed. Right. You got like, to Turns say, out, no, I don't, you know, yeah. it turns out I don't want to hug. I might punch you right now. Yeah. I'm not ready for right. a hug yet. I, I want to be mad or, but, but that's introspective. And that's being able to recognize you don't have to do it all perfect. Um, because quite frankly, you won't. And therefore, there is no perfect. There is no. And, and I don't even know that that's a particularly fun or quality of life thing to shoot for in no, any way. And it's, it's certainly not what we want to model for our children. Right. I frequently teach people, um, especially couples, how to give a good apology. Mm. And mm-hmm. I only learned like mm, the last seven years or so um, what a good apology looked like. And I have given some bad apologies. And a bad apology is probably worse than no apology. Give us a good one and a bad one to compare. Um, I'm sorry you feel that way. It's obviously not an apology. Well, um, you know what? You say obviously <laughs> because you have studied it, but some people would say that was fine. As opposed to being able to say something like, okay, I'm sorry that you interpreted it that way. Um, oh. I'm sorry that, that that is how it came across. It was not my intention. Let me tell you what was going on inside my head. Um, and I am sorry because that would have been hurtful, whatever. A good apology involves three steps. Are we ready to take yep. notes? Three All steps. Right. Three okay. steps. So the first step is sort of spelling it out what you did wrong. When I did this, it was wrong. And you spell out the this in HD quality. Okay. Um, when I called you that name, <laughs> when, <laughs> when I spoke over you, when I undermined your parenting, you know, with our you know, kid, when I did this, you know, when I did, and you spell out the this in detail. Okay. Ownership and accountability. Self-awareness, ownership. Okay. Then the next step is the real meat of it is where you spell out, and I know that it was wrong, and it was wrong because, and then you spell out how it negatively impacted them or the situation. Okay. It hurt your feelings. It was disrespectful. It did undermine your role as a parent. Um, it, whatever the it mm-hmm. is, you spell out what you did, how it negatively impacted them, and you're taking ownership for that. Okay. And then the third part is where you say, and for that, I'm sorry. And it's almost like the least important part of the apology, right? Absolutely. Now, timing matters too. Um, 
I can remember an apology uh, once that my husband gave me and it was really good. And I just wanted to be righteously indignant for a while. And, um, and I was like mad at him for apologizing. Well, like it was sort of bizarre, but this is not the soon. time to be effective. Yeah, I wanted to be, I wanted to be mad. Hold on. And that was the emotional immaturity of my part and I'll own it. Um, but the reality of it is timing matters too. Mm-hmm. Um, and sometimes you, maybe you have that light bulb moment and you own it and you grow from it. You know, I tell, I tell all of my clients, especially my teenagers, I don't really care so much about the mistakes you make. Um, unless you keep making the same one over, over and over because you're not yeah. learning and it must serve some purpose. But otherwise I care, what do you do when you realize you screwed up? That's sort of the snapshot of where you're at in your personal development. Mm-hmm. Do you try to distract with something else? Do you lie? Do you try to blame somebody else? you know, for it? Do you turn the tables and make it about what the other person did or distract with a different Mm -hmm. thing that they did wrong? Or do you try to own it and learn and grow from it? And and that's whether you're at home, whether you're parenting, whether you're leading a team, whether you're leading an organ, like I I look for that in people in all aspects of my life. Do you, do you just own it? And that's a huge part of making relationships healthy. Mm -hmm. Um, And if you find sort of routinely that you are owning it and you're doing a lot of these things, but your partner doesn't reciprocate. There's a clear problem. Mm -hmm. And nine times out of 10, those kind of problems have to do with something obviously within that person, their um, inability to see their role or refusal Mm -hmm. to emotionally be vulnerable to see that role. Um, Sometimes it is sort of personality disordered sort of traits. And by definition, most of those folks struggle with really deep rooted insecurities. Um, And so, and then that's- Which manifest in ways that- some people don't recognize as insecure. No, a lot of my experience, most controlling behavior is, is deep rooted insecurity. Mm-hmm. Uh, most judgmental, blaming, shaming, you know, behavior is insecurity. Mm-hmm. Um, and so it's talking about these stronger women sort of growing and you hear about these really unhealthy relationships yeah. that they're in and you're sort of surprised, but not surprised anymore. You know, there's probably maybe something about that woman's growth mm-hmm. that brought out insecurities, or maybe they didn't grow equally together. Um, and so it, but it takes ownership in so, order to grow past that. So what I'm hearing you say is if, if you are in that situation, one of those situations that the best way, or even the only way to be able to handle it well is to open the lines of communication to where you say, look, we need to, we need to talk about this. And if, if it's not something that you can do on your own to really come into, to a therapist's office and, and, and see if you can peel back some of the layers and see where that. Yeah, my, yeah, because my experience has been um, that by definition, not to be particularly hurtful or comparative, but as a general rule, women are more introspective about their emotional state and those kind of things. I'm sure it's right. sort of evolution of the species. We have the womb. We take care of the young. <laughs> so I'm assuming the there's a damn womb is that. always womb the root of all you blame for everything. <laughs> but ultimately, you know, we, we may be a little bit further along on that mm-hmm. continuum. And then we're trying to explain it to our, our spouse. And, and we take it too far. I think and, that we can. And they are. Everything. Yeah. And they aren't they maybe haven't been working on this or haven't been thinking about it or are maybe struggling with too many insecurities to be able to be introspective. Cause if I own one piece, I have to own it all perhaps. Mm -hmm. And so sometimes it's really unfortunate because by the time, you know, they're coming in, one person's pretty far down on that spectrum and the other person isn't really wanting to work on it. And it's just easier to want to be able to get into fault and blame and shame and judgment feels better Mm -hmm. um, to them. And so then that's a real difficult place to be in. Because by the time a lot of women are getting to the point of sharing and thinking about this kind of stuff, they've been doing a lot of introspective work. Um, and I don't know yeah. that we should necessarily be that surprised or hurt or unhappy or, or upset that maybe the spouse hasn't been. Um, it may be part of the reason there is this growing gap between I agree. them. I agree. And I don't want that gap to get bigger in general with between men and women. Because I, I worry about this whole, and, and one of the taglines I use a lot is, yes, do you, just don't do it alone. Like we do this, oh, well, I'm going to just do you and I'm going to be strong and independent. I, I never, ever want to be strong and independent. I want to be strong and connected because I've been strong and independent and it is freaking lonely. It's bad. And exhausting. Exhausting. Mm-hmm. So if, if we continue to say to young women and women, yes, go do your thing, but we don't have this conversation that says, and make sure you're staying connected and being vulnerable and open yourself up and ask for what you need. Mm -hmm. Then you're going to end up in a place where you may have a lot of money or status, but it's not going to be fun. Mm -hmm. 
it won't it, the, the happiness won't go as deep as it could no the contentment the joy and 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 i don't mean for it to sound so necessarily critical uh, you know of men i mean we're talking about some specific examples there's a lot of men who do this really well oh yeah who are wonderful cheerleaders who who love their their wife their spouse's status oh, and, i have an example of that one so she was on the podcast as well she did the top performer fraud podcast, um, Christine Trost, who I worked with for years and years and years. And her and her husband have a cool gig. So she's, when people meet her, like she's super strong out there. Like you're like, wow, this chick's got it together. And at home, they play the traditional roles of husband and wife better than in, lovingly and respectfully. Like he, he, he's the leader of their house. And she totally steps back and loves that aspect of it. She was like, I've led all day, people. I come home. I want my man to lead the house. And they just, when you're with them, you just feel good about life. And they, when they have struggles, they sit down and they have real conversations. They send the kids to grandma's and they say, okay, let's, let's figure this out. And, and it's just, you know, hashtag couple goals. I, I just... I love that they've said what they need out of their relationship. And for their personalities, yeah. that's a good fit. A lot of times what I find um, with couples that will come in here, they're two really strong leader personalities. Mm. Neither one of them are good at being in the passenger seat. Mm. Um, and so they're vying for power and control in ways that really aren't necessary. Um, and they both maybe have high achieving and they're not necessarily not supporting each other's career or path. Right. But they really haven't had the difficult conversations about, you know, at home. What, what does, does that look, look like? like? And so <laughs> then it's up with the toilet paper. Yeah, and then they have the fights <laughs> about the toilet paper um, or, or about the calendar. It's usually about the calendar. Oh, yeah, for mm -hmm. sure. Yeah. So again, you know, I always, I'm looking at the clock because we could do this for hours and hours. It's it's fun. And it's it's not just fun. It's so helpful and useful. And it's mapped into so many conversations that I've had with people that are struggling with some of these things. So um, we'll wrap up for today, but I can already think of three other topics that we need to schedule in the future. <laughs> so I think you might be a regular guest at the Badass Women's Council podcast. That would be fun. Excellent. Hey, thanks for inviting me. Thanks so much. I'm not coming down. Was I right or was I right? So much rich information in that episode. So as always, we have a couple of reflection questions for you. One is, are you comfortable being uncomfortable? Can you get there? We heard today that there's a lot of opportunity to really go deeper in all of our relationships when we let our guard down a little bit. And the second question is, do you have people that, can you, that you can really be yourself with? Uh, if not, go find them. That's what we're at about here at the Badass Women's Council is reflection and connection. So thanks again for being here. And if you're looking for some coaching or a keynote speaker, hit me up. I'm your girl. All right. Thanks so much. Make it a great day.